Hey there, this is Pastor Cassie. Thanks for listening to our messages online. At Sage Hills, we prioritize lifting high the name of Jesus and also being rooted in His Word. Real quick, we would love it if you would take a moment and download the Sage Hills app. It's the easiest way to listen and to share these messages. It's also the easiest way for you to stay connected with everything happening here. We pray that the message that you hear out of this house is not only anchored in God's Word, but that it would create a hunger for you to be in God's Word. Let's join in now on this week's message. Prepare your hearts to hear from God's Word as Pastor Cassie continues our series, When in Romans. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Sage Hills Church. Good morning. Gosh, I feel like I should dance at the end of that, right, coming out. Becky did a great job on announcements. Well, hey, I'm Cassie. I'm one of the pastors here, and happy Independence Day weekend, 4th of July weekend. It is one of my favorite holidays. The first is really just not up for debate. It's Christmas, okay? And Christmas um, kind of starts in July. Hallmark started that. That's maybe why I chose to wear green today. Uh, but Great American Family is actually even better than Hallmark. <clears throat> yes, okay. And, you know, 4th of July ties, like I said, for the second holiday for me, and I think it's with Easter. Both of them are independence celebrations, whether that is our independence here in the United States or it's because of the restorative work that Christ did on the cross. Are you grateful for your freedom today? We know that freedom is not free. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Well, hey, if you're new with us, welcome. We are so glad to have you. We'd love the opportunity to meet you. And so after service, if you take that I'm new card, stop by the Connection Center. We have um, a gift we'd love to give to you. And if you were online, thank you for joining us. And everybody, everybody, I want you all to know you're invited to Growth Track. Um, come back next week to participate, whether you are a Sage Hill Sage, or this is your first time, you've been here a few times, we'd love for you to participate in Growth Track to get you on track to unleashing your God-given potential. Okay. Well, I've got a question for you, and you don't feel like you have to respond, um, but I'm curious, how many of you guys have ever broken the law? Okay, we could all probably raise our hands, okay? We've all broken the law, and I just need you to know, um, I am an agricultural terrorist, and I recognize that for some people in the room, that is particularly offensive. <laughs> um, but a few weeks ago, maybe a few months ago, Mike and I were coming back from an international trip, and at the airport before we were boarding to get, come back to the U.S., I picked up an orange. And you all know that, you know, food at the airport is very expensive. <laughs> um, and I proceeded to not eat that orange the whole flight. And so as we were disembarking the plane, I thought, I'm just going to eat this orange really quick. It can't go to waste. And so we're waiting to go through customs, and I'm just chowing down on my little orange. And I have the peel in my hand, and we get to the checkpoint, and the, um, the agent turns to me, and he says, you've got to be kidding me. Now, some of you know what's happening right now. <laughs> and I'm like, no, this is not a joke. So um, he closes down his checkpoint, and he makes Mike and I shamefully walk like past, it felt like 50 different uh, checkpoints, into this agricultural screening area where we, again, had to wait a long period of time, <clears throat> practice our patience. And then they, you know, went through all of our luggage. We had to screen through it. And Mike, they confiscated his beef jerky. It was a sad, sorry mistake. It was so sad. <laughs> It was so sad. Um, but what if, after breaking the law, I truly had to announce myself as an agricultural terrorist? Aren't you so grateful that because of us breaking the law, we don't have to associate our identity with that? Amen? Amen? Jesus is the one that gets to define our identity. And we are going to be in chapter 7 of Romans talking about the law, um, and um, it's going to be super exciting. <laughs> okay, now, but we're not just talking about U.S. law. We're going to be talking about spiritual law. And I'm so grateful that law doesn't define us, but that law truly is a tool um, that helps guide us. It helps define sin, and it helps confront character. Okay, so we're going to be in... Romans chapter 7, and Pastor Troy did a phenomenal job last week closing up the end of chapter 6, and I'd encourage you, if you've missed any of the sermons throughout our Romans series, you can listen to them throughout the week on our podcast. Please do that. I think they're awesome. 
Um, and Romans, just briefly, a quick summary, is a book in the Bible, and it's a letter that Paul writes to the church in Rome. He hasn't been to this church. <clears throat> and Paul, he's known as Saul. Paul's his Roman name, Saul is his Hebrew name. And he writes a lot of the New Testament. He writes a lot of these letters to the churches. But Paul has a challenging background. Um, many of you know that his history, we read about in Acts chapter six through eight, that he's a terrorist, that he's responsible for the murder of many Christians. In fact, he's persecuted the Christian church. <clears throat> now Paul, um, he, he's born a Jew. And not only is that in his DNA and in his culture, but Paul is an ex-member of this first century religious authority, which means that he has had considerable training in the Jewish culture, in their history, and he is very convinced of his convictions, okay? Which is why it is monumental when we get to Acts chapter nine that when Paul meets Jesus on the road to Damascus, not only does he profess him as Lord and make a 180 degree repentance change to his life reflecting the sanctifying work of Christ, he dedicates his life to the spreading of the gospel, okay? To his missionary work. And that challenges his Jewish community. It challenges his Jewish community. His own people, they start gossiping. And we all know that gossip is the beginning of peace. It brings honor, restores relationships. I was really hoping you guys would respond like that because we all know gossip does no good, right? And they're gossiping. They're saying that Paul is no longer a Jew. They're saying that he's converted to this new faith and Paul is saying, I am not converted to a new faith. Jesus is the promised Messiah come. It's a continuum, it's what we've been waiting for. It's the final expression of the Jewish tradition. And so that hurts Paul, but he continues on and he writes many of these books confronting many of the disagreements that they have about the belief <clears throat> that Jewish Christianity is a new religion. Now, the book of Romans is themed on righteousness. I don't know what keeps hitting, so I'll just throw my hair back. Okay, um, it's themed on righteousness. And there's a few different dynamics that pop up um, in the book of Romans, but they all have tensions around the Old Testament law. And so we're gonna be in the first 14 verses of Romans chapter seven today, and if you brought your Bibles, please start turning there. <clears throat> and Paul begins our text with an analogy of marriage. Um, and he kind of does a, a he, explanation about things that are mixed with law that maybe we've misunderstood. And so I've titled the message today, Mix Understandings. Mix Understandings. So Paul starts out talking about marriage, and because of that, I just wanted to make a special note here, guys. Sometimes the church can appear to idolize marriage. And the truth is that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 7, singleness is a gift. Singleness is also a gift. And I don't want to negate the value of that. And so God bless the marriages in this room. God bless you if you're called to singleness. But either way, wherever you're at, both of these lifestyles require grit, commitment, and endurance. And for me, I'm married, even with me being married to the most amazing person in the world, Pastor Mike, amen? <laughs> Everybody's, no, I'm just kidding, don't do it. Okay, so uh, if you're at Romans chapter seven, would you say amen? Amen. Okay, I'm gonna invite you all to stand. Uh, we will do our Sage Hills Liturgy. And if you're new with us, this is your way of participating in the message this morning. Um, it's the way that we honor the word of the Lord. And I've got a part, you've got a part, Sage Hills Church. Are you ready? ready. Okay, this is the word of God. Let's together. Hallelujah. Okay, I've got everything in bold that I'd like for you guys to read out loud. We're a long little portion here, but we're gonna get through it, okay? Romans 7, 1 through 14 says... Do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law. that the law has authority over someone only as long as the person lives? For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law that binds her to him. So then, if she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she's called an adulteress, but if her husband dies, she is and is not an adulteress if she marries another man. So my, you also died to the law through the body of Christ that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work within us so that we bore fruit for death. But now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that and not in the old way of the written code. 
what shall we say then? Is the law sinful? I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of... For apart from the law, sin was dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me, and through the commandment, put me to death. So then, and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Did that which is good then become death to me? Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it used what is good to bring about my death, so that through the commandment, my uh, commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. We know that the law is spiritual. But I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. Would you pray with me? Oh, Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful for your truth and your goodness. And so this morning, today, we invite you in to unmask some of the assumptions we've made. God, as we truly humble our hearts, Lord, let the walls come down so that your truth would pierce and penetrate our hearts, God. Let your truth uh, just marinate in our hearts so we can be further connected to you. Lord, bring life. Spirit, you're invited to this place. Fill your children in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Before you have a seat, turn to your neighbor and say, don't mess with the mix. Have you guys ever gotten a gift that maybe you didn't know what it was? Or maybe you held on to it for a while and then later, kind of the value to it kind of started to kind of come to life? Well, um, I, the, the thought that comes to mind when I ask this question is, you know, when Mike and I brought our daughter Carrington home, um, we had everything that we needed. And so my grandpa decided to buy this gift for us. I've got a picture up here on the screen. He bought us this Breville espresso maker. It was timely, it was awesome and perfect. And at the time we lived in California, but you Washington folk have a better understanding of what good coffee and good espresso is. So I felt like you'd do some appreciation for that. But Mike and I, we've loved this machine since 2010. And uh, you know, it's saved us a lot of money. It's made early mornings like that much easier. And there's been some maintenance over the years, but the most expensive thing to maintain on this machine was the porter filter. And the porter filter, if you don't know what that is, it's basically what you put the grinds into, you tamper it down and you pull your shots from, okay? But over the years, the handle started to kind of crack and pieces kind of broke off of it, okay? And I just want you to know that from the time we got this machine to now, we have moved five times. So I have packed this machine up and unpacked it five different times. And it was not until this last time of unpacking that I kind of pulled out what I thought was a storage container for some of the pieces of the Breville maker. And I realized that it was a knock box. Now, a knock box is what you actually hit the portafilter on, like just a few little taps and the grinds come out. What we had been doing for the previous 10 years was banging it across our trash can on the handle. I mean, it was loud, it caused frustration, it even caused damage and expense. (laughs) But I had realized that the container had a different purpose. There was truly a solution to my problem um, that I could have avoided if I had realized the value of this knockbox. And in the same way, we have some misunderstandings about the purposes that the law has in our lives. There's intention, there is a masterful design, but there's also brokenness and darkness and sin. So when we talk about the different combinations that's mixed with the law that Paul talks and addresses in our text this morning, I wanna invite you to maybe having an open mind and an open perspective to seeing how spiritual law maybe has a different intent and meaning for us today. Are you guys with me? Say amen, okay, great. Well, right off the bat, Paul says who he is speaking to. He has a specific audience in his text. In chapter seven, verse one, he says, do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those that know the law. 
So Paul's speaking to the Jews, the ones that know the law, like really, 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 really well, right? They're the (laughs) know-it-alls. None of us know any people like that in our lives, right? The people that have no other way to see things, right? There's no other way of looking at it, nothing to learn from it because they know know it. Uh, But Paul's needing to have a confrontation with these people. And it's not that uh, he's doing it to bring shame. It's doing it because, he's doing it because he wants to invite them to life. And so the first combination that we're gonna talk through this morning is the combination of law and us. Law and us, that's the first mixed understanding that we have. And to give you some context about spiritual law. Spiritual law is the law that was given to Adam in the garden in Genesis 3.13, when God commands Adam to not eat from the tree of good and evil, the knowledge of good and evil, and then he warns him that there would be death And not only that, not just death for Adam, but death for many generations to come, and that results in separation from God. Adam and Eve no longer get to live in the wholeness, in the completeness of the garden. And then law is later formally given to Moses on Mount Sinai. We know that as the Ten Commandments. Today, that's in Exodus chapter 20. And in the text that we've just read, those 14 verses, Paul, when he talks about the law, he he talks about it both positively And he talks about it negatively. And so the question is, is the law good or is the law bad? The answer is that the law is perfect. And the purpose was to direct us to a holy God. What the law did was it confronted character and that the law itself does not bring death. Okay? And so there's some mixed understandings and I just... In the background in my mind, I'm hearing um, Taylor Swift sing Antihero. Hello, hi, I'm the problem, it's me, okay? When we are in the mix with law, that's what brings death. It's not law itself. In verse five, it says, for when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work within us so that we bore fruit for death. We are flesh in that combination. What it results and what it turns into is it becomes superficial, It becomes about what to do, what not to do, right? And the focus is then taken off of God and it's placed, guess where, onto us. Pastor Marie gave this perfect analogy when she was preaching about the throne, that Jesus truly belongs on that throne. And so that's the combination we're talking about today. Combo number one is the law on us. And guys, this is America. When I think of combos, I really want my combo to come with fries and a milkshake. (laughs) But that's not the law, the combination we're talking about today, we're talking about combination of law and us. So when it is the law and us, our flesh, what that equals is sin and death. Verse 10 says, I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. You see, the law does not and will never be what produces righteousness in our lives. That's not its job. Its job is to connect us to a holy God. Righteousness is only created by God and God alone. It can't be manipulated or artificially made. And although law was intended to work on behalf of our wholeness and our sanctification, it brought death because we twisted the law. We made law legalistic instead of spiritual. We get to choose how to respond. And because of sin, law is now counted on the side of death. In essence, what law did is it brought about this greenhouse effect. Are there any serious gardeners in the room? Maybe you have a greenhouse at your house, okay. Well, a greenhouse brings concentrated growth, right? It creates a culture and an atmosphere with this hyper growth. And in this case, it's not producing anything good. It's growing things like the belief that relationship is God, and God, relationship with God is about achievement. That distorts the design. And there's a tension in this time that's exposed. And the tension is the time of the law that was between the time of Adam and now Jesus, the promised Messiah, come. You see, there's a new demand for salvation. John 14, 6 says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life that nobody gets to the Father except through him. And guys, this brings a perspective shift. The law's been misunderstood. In fact, it's been idolized. The only way for salvation is through Jesus Christ alone when we put faith in him, not in action, but with our hearts. When, um, you know, when I think about sin, I think it is often um, concluded that sin is only a result of action, right? But the truth is that sin is defined by our hearts. 
you know, when Jesus is on um, giving the, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, Matthew chapter five, he kind of references some of these 10 commandments and he brings a different perspective. One of the ways that he does this is when he says, um, he's referencing thou shall not murder. But Jesus says that anybody who is angry at his brother or sister actually commits murder in their hearts. Oh, yeah. It's not just the action, it's the heart. And although Adam did eat from the tree at the center of the garden, he disregarded and breached the command that God had given him. What it revealed was a lack of trust in God. It was a reach for power. You know, last, not last week, a few weeks ago, Pastor Mike shared in his sermon that sin, it starts with us being complacent to sin and then we become compliant to sin. And we often dismiss sin until we've been caught and it's been put up in our face, right? And then we make excuses, we try to make up reasons or uh, ways that it's not our fault, but the truth is that God is perfect. He was perfect in Adam's circumstance and God is perfect in our circumstances, amen? Amen. 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 And in his perfection, what it does is it just confirmed our sinful character. The problem is not whatever we've conjured up the problem to be, truly, the problem is sin. And that's the result of combination number one. Law on us equals death. That's a great way to start the day, right? Oh, goodness. Okay, well, now that we know where the problem is, there's a solution. Let's graduate ourselves to combination number two. Combination number two is law and Christ. And listen, there has been a little bit of misunderstanding here, okay? Adam represents our flesh. He represents that there is a sin problem, okay, we've established that, and Jesus, we know, is the solution, okay? And remember, Paul's speaking to a specific audience here. He's speaking to those that know the law, and for them, the law is so sacred, and he's inviting them to die to their past understanding of that, because living under the law and the written code does not promise eternal life with Christ. How many of you know that embracing a new thing is hard? Yes, brace, okay. Some of us, even if we're up for the change, when push comes to shove, there are hard realities that we experience. If we know that it's good, even if we've chosen it, there's realities that just come up, we come up against. And on staff, what we do is we call it pivot culture. Like, hey, pivot culture, because it keeps our mind focused on what's ahead. Change has these felt realities that stir up our flesh and our emotions and our responses. Whether we believe it or not, our flesh fights to respond, but ultimately, We get to choose how we respond, and are we going to respond in our flesh or in our spirit? Remember, the problem's not the law. The problem's us, and this is a hang-up for so many of the Jews. It changes what they know. It changes their relationship with the law. In verse one, the second part of it, it says that the law has authority over someone only as long as the person lives. You see, this is temporary. It's temporary. And what Christ did is he fulfilled the law for all of us. Verse four says, so my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. Now church, there's a different reality placed before us. We are the bride of Christ. Fellas, I know you love hearing that you are beautiful as the bride of Christ. (laughs) But truly, we are the bride of Christ. It's referenced in Matthew and John, Corinthians, Ephesians, Revelation. Christ is the bridegroom, okay? And this marriage metaphor is between, it reflects Christ and the believer. And our text says today that we, as believers, have been released from the law, that marriage is now dead. Our marriage and our commitment to these Old, Old Testament commandments, we are free because of Christ, that's so timely. Independence Day, we are free, hallelujah. Combination number one has been manipulated by sin, but guys, combination number two equals liberty. It equals freedom. Christ came and promised us freedom. And there's a new season for the church ahead that's been introduced by Christ. You see, Christ paid the law in full, hallelujah, and now the Old Testament pattern of living by the book, of being a life marked by the law is over, and we've been invited back to put our trust in where it always belonged in the first place, in God. Our trust should never have been in the law. And you know, I just think it's so interesting that we walk around 
and on all of our U.S. currency, it says, in God we trust, right? We spend and we live out this, we've lost the connection to the reality of in God we trust, but truly, do we really trust God? Have we trusted the Lord with our whole hearts? Because it would change the way that we live. (laughs) And I'm gonna invite you to think about the realities of where you can trust the Lord more. But listen, what Christ came for with that salvation is so good, but let's not stop there. What Christ did is he widows us from the law in verse four so that we might belong to another in order that we may bear fruit for God. Guys, I'm so thankful for my freedom and for my salvation, but I want everything. I want all that God has for me, don't you? Don't you? Let's not stop there. Now that we have this freedom experience, let's walk according to the spirit, not to the flesh. In verse six, we are no longer captive to death, but new life in the spirit. And so moving forward, let's have a life marked by the spirit. And life marked by the spirit is not temporary, church. It's eternal. So we have to die to the patterns that Adam set, right, that we see, the sin And we die through that, through Christ alone, there is no other way. He's delivered us from the rule of death and that now changes, it changes our relationship with the law. Now that we've been made righteous through Christ, we are free of guilt and shame, not because we've earned it, because we've been gifted it, and it's not because of us, it's because of Jesus. The law has been fulfilled, but he invites us to this new relationship. So the mix of law and us we know is death. The combination of law and uh, number two of law and Christ is freedom and liberty, but what are we gonna do with that liberty? I hope you choose combo number three, and that is the law and the spirit. He invites us to living life in the spirit. And for so many of us believers here, we stop there with our relationship with Christ, with salvation. But he wants to graduate us to life in Christ and life in the spirit. Guys, the debt has been paid, we've been liberated, but what is freedom for? And through our freedom, we don't wanna have that same relationship with the law. There's actually a different way of living to experience the fruit of the spirit. You know, the law unmasked the manipulation that sin had, right, with death. But it does not negate the deeper, fuller purposes that the law was designed for, to bring about character. So what are we gonna do with our liberty? We get to shift our mindset and approach the law as life lived in with the spirit. And then the design, the original design of the law is evident as good. Galatians 5.22 tells us what the fruit of living in the spirit looks like, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, hallelujah. Who wants more of that in their lives? I know I do. And it says that there, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. It says that there is no law against those things by contrast. And there's an outpouring of a spirit that liberates us from the previous narrowed understanding of the law and its roles in our lives. It brings what was unconscious back to the conscious, that we are no longer having to function over or with our flesh and our blood, but truly function under the spirit. And the spirit is a higher nature than our own. I'm so grateful for that. Life built in law is certain to be manipulated by death, but listen to what scripture says. Um, Seven, uh, chapter seven, verse six says, "But, but now, By dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Ephesians 8 verse four says, in order that the righteous requirement of law might be fully met in us, we do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And 2 Corinthians 3.15 says, now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, hallelujah, there is freedom. Oh, praise the Lord for that. And there's a renewal. There's a primarily, like what has been created comes to life. 
And we get to move in life with the Spirit. Verse 12 tells us, it reminds us, I will say, that the law is holy. The commandment is holy, righteous, and good. And so that brings about this polarizing conclusion that the duality of the law is that the law does not have to be counted on the side of death. The law can bring life. If we live and we shift our reality in living by the Spirit, and not just having the written code of the law written on our hearts, but we actually live and are obedient through our hearts. Amen? I'm gonna invite the worship team back up. Um, and, you know, I was thinking through, um, the, I, I have a lot of thoughts, I think a lot. I know that is really hard for you sometimes. <laughs> um, but, you know, the first, the place to start is that we realize truly, like do we truly realize the problem of sin, that it starts with us? Are we ready to stop shifting the blame? Because that's where it starts. But combination number two truly invites us to freedom. And many of us have more freedom to experience in how we trust God. And so I just want you, like even if you feel uncomfortable with this, to keep your eyes closed during the worship time and to be thinking through like it ways that the Lord is asking you to trust him further, deeper in, in your life. But also don't stop there <laughs> because the reality is there is even more life to be experienced in the spirit. And maybe you've given your life to Christ and you haven't experienced the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, <laughs> kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But that's the life that we are invited to. And the worship team's not up here. But how about you guys close your eyes and we'll just start praying together. And I, I really do want you to get in a space with the Lord today, not thinking about the person you're sitting next to or people that can see you where you're at, but truly like inviting the conversation with the Lord, like how have I not trusted you in my circumstance? Adam examples that in the garden that was perfect, and so we all are probably experiencing that in our lives. How can we trust you more fully, God? I also want to invite the prayer team up um, to, to be able to pray with some of uh, the people as they come up and process that, pray over them, pray with them. And then maybe that's not where you're at. Maybe your prayer is to truly live life more fully in the spirit. Gosh, I think about that list, and I mean love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Maybe one of those tugging at your heart, just revealing the truth that the spirit wants to infiltrate your whole heart. And so invite him in. Invite him in to live life fully the way that the spirit gives life to. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let's praise the Lord. I hope you enjoyed the message today. I want to encourage you to go ahead and to share it with your friends and your family. I also want to thank you for all that you do for your part of the ministry at Sage Hills Church. Whether you partner with us through prayer or serving, giving financially, or even sharing the message, thank you for making what we do possible. God bless you.